Zimbabwe's finest, finest, finest radio. ZFM Stereo. That is Messi! It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. It's time for the biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, on top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport. Let's join the team for the biggest show in the world of sport on CFM Stereo. My station, your station. Thursday evening, good evening and welcome to It's EFM, a sport, the shortened version. And today we are looking at the world of tennis together with our producer, Sean Tafirinika. My name is Barry Manandi. And in the world of tennis, there are few names that catch the eye and are recognizable quite as the name of Maria Sharapova. <laughs> <laughs> ZFM Stereo is untouchable. It's her life and story that's in focus on the show today. Maria Sharapova, and she's given up the uneven struggle against injury and announced she has finished with tennis at the age of 32 in an emotional open letter in Vogue and Vanity Fair magazines yesterday. We spoke about this on the show last night and today we go a little bit deeper. After a career that yielded five Grand Slam titles, hundreds of millions of earnings and a reputation that became severely tarnished, she revealed her retirement through the pages of magazines. She will be remembered for her major wins. Her relentless baseline hitting delivered with a piercing shriek and failing a drugs test at the 2016 Australian Open. Maria Sharapova, we salute her. Of course, Maria, one of the names that are synonymous with tennis, certain modern day game, uh, Sean. And that is because largely she had that rivalry between her and Serena that just captured the imagination in the women's game didn't it but we can't call it a rivalry though because mm. it really wasn't i it mean if wasn't. you look at it 19 nine, 19 wins for serena williams yeah. and two wins for uh, maria sharapova it doesn't necessarily constitute as a rivalry and i blame the media for that i think the media built up this supposed rivalry when it really wasn't there and almost in a way villainized maria sharapova because if you think about it not a lot of people like her no no and it's no, partly no. because serena was the hero yeah. and every hero has a villain and that became maria but sharapova is it, is it, isn't the rivalry born out of the fact that they had so many meetings that they met so much at grand slams in and out of tournaments they 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 were yeah fine it was heavily weighted in serena's favor and you can't blame it because of serena is just that good Uh, but you you think to yourself had serena not been playing tennis at the time that maria was playing Maria would have probably had a, a stellar career and, and come out with a few more Grand Slams, you will say. Well, yeah, I mean, ultimately, well, she came up with five Grand Slams, yep. which um, is not too bad. Not and, too shabby. And she, she shared the looks for it. That's the other thing. Yeah. I mean, if you look at this uh, gorgeous blonde, six foot two, yeah. beautiful green eyes, <laughs> looked like a model. She got all the endorsements and she made a play, uh, she made a splash on the tennis world. Yes, uh, please, yeah, sure, I'll have a slice of that. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, she certainly did. But it, it also made her very, very marketable uh, because she um, had access to different markets. So uh, the, the, the market of uh, beauty and hair and, and fittingly announcing a retirement at Vogue and Vanity Fair. You can see how that syncs up, don't you? Exactly. Yeah, I know that, that I think that's the perfect platform for Mira Sharapova. It also ties into her various business endeavors as well because we know that she was leaning towards that direction. But we have to talk about the failed drugs test. Drugs test, Because yeah. I feel like after she lost a lot of her endorsements, it was sort of like a reality check for her. Mm. And th- that has tainted what would be a legacy, I suppose. Yeah, and uh, it would have been a stellar legacy uh, without that uh, drugs test. I know I, I quipped on the show last night talking about the fact that, you know, besides being a drug cheat, and that, that was a little unfair, uh, but that failed drugs test will always hang over her and everybody will assume that she was a drug cheat, but that's all it was. It was a failed drugs test and we can't remove all the body of work uh, that constitutes her career. Her comeback after that drugs test 
didn't go according to plan. It didn't. And I, I think this ties to the niggling injuries because initially the drug she was taking would help her cope with the pain. Because I, I also understand that, that she also used to have some heart problems. But it's her shoulder. Her shoulder gave her consistent problems. And she actually cites it in a retirement uh, piece mm. letter. I don't know uh, yeah, what we call piece. it. Yeah. Piece is a nice <laughs> retirement word. Retirement <laughs> piece, yeah. About how her body is, just seems to be breaking down and she couldn't cope anymore. She would come back and she just wasn't competing enough to get a ranking high yeah. so that she could enter tournaments or they had to rely on the wild card and mm. she just never got going because every time she'd come back those injury setbacks and she was just never the same so and it's a whole new world i mean you got your coco goffs of this world a teenager exactly. who's blowing up the scene you got ash barty who's coming through you got so the world of tennis has certainly moved on but maria sharapova will always remain on our lips as one of the great ones Hi, this is Benjamin Luck. I'm on the Zimbabwe Davis Cup team, and you're listening to ZFM Sport. So fittingly, therefore, let's hear from Maria Sharapova, starting with her retirement open letter in Vogue and Vanity Fair. We'll then hear about her failed drugs test in 2016 that led to suspension from the sport for a year. Uh, her experiences growing up in America as an immigrant coupled with her personality as a bit of a loner. Uh, bet you didn't know that. And also we'll get some insight into her business acumen, which Sean alluded to, which culminated in her going to Harvard Business School. In her own words on ZFM Sport, here's Maria Sharapova. Today I published a piece announcing my retirement. I wanted to read through some parts of it and offer some reflections. Alright, shall we? How do you leave behind the only life you've ever known? How do you walk away from the courts you've trained on since you were a little girl, the game that you love, one that brought you untold tears and unspeakable joys, a sport where you found a family, along with fans who rallied behind you for more than 28 years. 28 years is a really long time. I'm new to this, so please forgive me. Tennis, I'm saying goodbye. To have that moment of reflection was very special. It's nice to have it on paper. It, it makes it very real and honest and, I guess, official. When I was six, I traveled across the globe to Florida with my father. The whole world seemed gigantic back then. The airplane, the airport, the wide expanse of America, everything was enormous, as was my parents' sacrifice. This photo, um, I was about six years old and it was my first day spent on the Florida beach. They seemed incredible and beautiful and pristine and special and rich. I was just internally happy and happy to be in this new country, in this new world, surrounded by children my age, and really just playing tennis, just playing this, this sport. The first courts I ever played on were uneven concrete with faded lines. They were awful. Over time, they became muddy clay and the most gorgeous manicured grass your feet could ever step upon. But never in my wildest dreams did I think I'd ever win on the sport's biggest stages and on every surface. Wimbledon seemed like a good place to start. I was a naive 17-year-old, still collecting stamps, and didn't understand the magnitude of my victory until I was older. And I'm glad I didn't. You always think of what mo your first successful moment might look or feel like, but you get there and it, it, it is very different because it's real, it's become a reality and yes, you won this huge thing, but life goes on. My edge though was never about feeling superior to other players. It was about feeling like I was on the verge of falling off a cliff, which is why I constantly returned to the court to figure out how to keep climbing. I sometimes wonder if athletes feel the same way that I do because I've never felt this consistent urge to be overly confident and to feel like I have achieved everything I ever wanted to achieve because I feel like it's so easy to just fall from that. Confidence is beautiful, but it's like how often do you really feel confident for a long period of time? These courts revealed my true essence. Behind the photo shoots and the pretty tennis dresses, they exposed my imperfections, every wrinkle, every drop of sweat. They tested my character, my will, my ability to channel my raw emotions into a place where they worked for me instead of against me. I would get on the court and it was as if like everything didn't exist. It was just my time on the court to improve, to get better, and to work towards being a champion. The sport was able to expose some of my greatest characteristics. The, the characteristic of never giving up, of fighting for every point, of going after my dreams. When I'm sweating and I'm pumping my fist and 
I don't look very pretty, but I look tough. And I love that version of myself. Listening to this voice so intimately, anticipating its every ebb and flow, is also how I accepted those final signals when they came. Shoulder injuries are nothing new for me. Over time, my tendons have frayed like a string. I've had multiple surgeries and spent countless months in physical therapy. I share this not to garner pity, but to paint my new reality. My body had become a distraction. It felt like a sum of so many days and experiences, doctor appointments for my shoulder, to come to this decision. I don't think there are enough pages that we could have printed out or I could explain like the things that I had to go through in order just to get myself to playing, to getting on the court, to practicing, to playing a competitive match. And I guess this was the best way that I could. Tennis showed me the world and it showed me what I was made of. It's how I tested myself and how I measured my growth. And so in whatever I might choose for my next chapter, my next mountain, I'll still be pushing. I'll still be climbing. I'll still be growing. The end. <laughs> is it worth it? Like that question that I, that I wrote in this essay, like, is it worth it? Throughout 28 years of my life, it was completely worth it. It was never a doubt. It was never a question and I would just keep going. And that was an important question that I asked myself throughout my entire career. If I look at myself in the future, this is what I would probably say. You have a long way to go and you will form many more incredible memories in your life. They will come with ups and downs as they did in the previous 28 years of your life. But use each moment to navigate forward. Don't forget who you are along the way and good things will always happen because they usually do. Well, this is all I got for now. Z. In so many ways, if I would, if it would feel like I would be going backwards and, and starting from, from scratch. And I, it's still a question that I occasionally do ask myself, and I ask myself for a long period of time after I received that notice. Um, how did it happen? What did I do wrong? What did I not notice? Um, who was around me to help me with this? Um, and it's not really the way that I decided to go about it. It wasn't, I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to rewind. But I, I am someone that wants to learn from my mistakes. But in this situation, um, when you're taking something legally for numerous amount of years, that is a common, supplement in Russia used by thousands of people, in, including my grandmother, which is, <laughs> I mean, I, I can laugh about it now. It wasn't funny at the time, but it's just such an odd and a very odd thing that it all of a sudden becomes banned and I'm not aware of it and no one around me, um, whether it's myself, my team, um, the organizations, let me know. I think what was really frustrating was it could have been avoided so easily if I would have known. But to go about it in details and to, and to um, speak to everyone and to blame everyone, it's just not, not the way that I chose to go about it. And I really think that that helped me. And I, I speak openly about it in the book because it's a huge part of, of an athlete's career. And what, what happened to me was, I mean, it was very difficult. It's one of the toughest things that an athlete can go through. Um, I've had shoulder surgery. I went through that. Um, I've been through my fair shares of up and ups and downs, but this was um, this was a big hit. And I, ha I mean, it was it was important to share to share it. The biggest problem was this sense of complacency in a system that I had for a long time, and in which I learned you just you simply can't be complacent in a situation like that. Um, the, the smallest details, you know, and. We have so many things going on, um, whether it's playing, traveling, the body, the equipment, the team. There's so many details there. There are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of people involved, but on the other side, there's, there's really not. I mean, it's a very small knit group that I have. I don't have a huge, huge entourage of people that travel with me. It's only a handful of people. Um, but it was definitely complacency. And I start that by saying from my end as well. Because, as I said from the very beginning, um, as an athlete, you take responsibility. It's not your coach. It's not 
it's not a manager it's not your your parents it's your it's your career it's your life it's your body and yeah for all the years that I was doing these forms I was writing down as it said in the instructions the the medicines or supplements that you were supposed to write down for the past 7 days so everything that I was taking continuously every single day for the past 7 days I would write down and this was not something that I took every single day I constantly have to get checkups I constantly have to go to the doctor um I get regular EKGs a lot more than than other people would um blood work and all of that and yeah i mean i i take very i mean i'm as you can imagine i'm very detail oriented after this happened i came to america as an immigrant and i spent the first many years being you know someone at the academy that was much younger than everyone else that was really on a different mission than everyone else um that weren't as competitive that weren't um as driven as i was had different goals and visions for their lives and um and i was always someone that was beating girls and boys that were older than i was so in a way they didn't like me for that and i felt that <laughs> i felt that energy and um and i wanted to to beat them even more that growth period that i had i mean i didn't you know i didn't have any siblings um it was just me and i wasn't around my parents very often the first few years in america so it was really me and the tennis racket and the ball and the coaches that were around me trying to make me a better tennis player so it was an absolutely lonely time and i had to i had to deal with that and i had to isolate like i really did feel isolated from from the rest I am Maria Sharapova. I am an athlete and an owner of a candy business called Sugarpova. I think the first time I really got excited about money was when after winning Wimbledon, um I used to take trips to Los Angeles from Florida to to train with a coach and we could only afford to do that um so many times during the year because of the expenses of hotels and travels and all of that. Um but after winning Wimbledon, we stayed at a much better hotel and I remember there's a little yellow rubber duck and I called my manager as soon as I like walked into the 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 tub in the bathroom and I was like, "Wow, winning Wimbledon is the best thing ever. I get this tub and I get this rubber duck and you know the things that a teenager looks forward to." I think when you grow up not necessarily having a lot or not necessarily understanding what is a lot and how much it it actually takes to work for nothing um I realized that it's a not only is it a personal possession and it's always your choice with what you do and um your actions ultimately determine how far or low it takes you um but it's also being um under the influence of of really strong characters of parents um very disciplined people that um you know every single day that taught me something very valuable my father was more in sports and um you know something i i speak about in, in my book um was that my father was more of the the sports influence and then when i would come home my my mother was the cultural um there was the schoolwork it was the life lessons and and then i would get the life lessons on the court from my father that um kind of transitioned onto kind of my character when you're young you don't understand what an well you kind of do but you might not have the resources to understand what an investment really means investment um can be a small can be large but you know in sport you invest a lot without having any guarantees and that's maybe you know tennis is quite different maybe to to team sports where you're guaranteed a certain amount and of course you want to be a champion and your team wants to be a champion and you do everything to to become that but there's something on the line when you know that you've invested all this this money and there's still no guarantee um that you'll ever return it back or make more so with that in mind i always I mean my family and i always made decisions based on that um it's like well if it doesn't work out like how much could we actually afford how much do we actually have at our possession i'd say when you start from not much and and you make um you know you make money throughout your career i think you better be involved in in and all like from the smallest things to the largest things i have someone that overlooks my my portfolio but i have constant meetings about it and i make decisions and i also try to i mean learning i think is i didn't have a formal type of education when i was young and i somewhat became street smart by traveling the world by having to show up really um when you go to a tournament there's so many responsibilities as an athlete it's not just yes it's walking through a tunnel and performing in front of thousands of people but 
there's the way that you carry yourself there's the fans that expect a lot from you in moments when you're down and maybe you haven't had a good match so I think it's the presence it's the press conferences it's the sponsor visits um, you know it takes a lot of people to make something happen and r just realizing that is extremely important um, to me the thing that I do I mean, there's similarities with sport and business in the sense that, yeah, I am very competitive and I do want to be, I do want to be successful in the businesses that I have. You know, I get off the court and I, I work through things in my mind of things that I want to achieve and um, people that I want to work with. But um, I think I've, I've definitely understood and, and still learning the the relationship building process and you know, I think they call it networking but it's such it's a little bit of a of a cold and strange word but in a sense it's you know like getting to know people and the connections that you make with people and people always come back in your life at some point um, and in the end it's always a very very small world when something comes across that's very challenging and difficult I always say that how you handle it no matter in what field it is um, will ultimately be how you handle other things in life I found myself in a classroom with 50 people that were much wiser and older than I was, and mostly men <laughs> as well. Um, it was probably 80% um, male to 20% female, and I had to be the one that would come up and, and speak to them. I think there's also like a little bit of intimidation factor, and I think they expected me to be in, in a classroom. Um, and so speaking to them and understanding what everybody does and you know we're there kind of on the same mission maybe for different ideas and different products and some are CEOs some are starting in a company it's not just about going to Harvard and getting a stamp or a little piece of paper with a diploma there's so much more for me it was really getting to know the people and like that unfamiliar ground because I'm always around people I know so just throwing myself out there was and like asking a question in a schoolroom, it's like, okay, at Harvard, <laughs> when you're like not having an answer, but you're asking a question, like, okay, once I did that, I, I cooled down. Z. Maria Sharapova there speaking candidly about her life and times in the world of tennis. And we certainly salute her here on ZFM Sport. We have to salute her, even though she hangs up her ra racket. Uh, she's done enough for us to doff our hats, to stand up for a true champion and, uh, dare I say, legend. Yeah, I was, I was finding it difficult, you know, to really think about how I feel about Maria Sharapova and sure. as a friend of mine and I said how do you talk about someone who's not so like the shout out to Bubs she yeah. said just focus on the wins yeah. and ultimately you can't discount those five grand slams and a legacy I mean she was a fierce competitor yeah, yeah, yeah. almost on mamba levels as well right. very relentless mm -hmm. and yeah even you know the shrieking on the court yeah. <laughs> we'll miss it <laughs> <No>. dearly <laughs> that just describes the intensity as well <laughs> it certainly does so salute and a big, big salute to Maria Sharapova as she walks off into the sunset with her racket hanging on the hook at one of the tennis venues around the world at so many where she lit up the stage when she walked onto it. Our play of the day is next.